We are on Galatians chapter two, about midway through it. And we started last week or a month ago looking at this confrontation that Paul had with Peter. Some Bibles translations say Cephas, some say Peter, um, the same person, Peter, the disciple of Jesus. And I'm not going to go back into a lot of what we talked about last week um, at the first part of chapter two. But in the first part of chapter two, there, they had been to, Paul writes about the time they had been to Jerusalem. They had the council of Jerusalem to settle what the issue is. And the issue being, is a person justified by grace through faith in Jesus alone? Or is a person justified or declared righteous or innocent before God by faith plus obedience to the law? <clears throat> is it faith alone or faith and obedience to the law? And so coming out of the Jerusalem Council meeting in Acts chapter 15, in Acts 15, 11, Acts 15, 10 and 11, they settle on the truth of the gospel. And the truth of the gospel is that righteousness, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> is that righteousness is by faith alone in Jesus alone. Justification, being declared innocent before God, is by faith alone in Jesus alone, apart from works, apart from the law of Moses. So that's the truth they settled on. And so in Galatians, Paul is giving a chronological timeline of his life. And he's given this chronological timeline to one, tell the Galatians people, the Galatian people, that what he's teaching is the truth. And so in this chronological timeline, he comes to a piece of biblical information that is many times missed within Bible history. And it's the time when Peter turns his back on the decision they made in Acts chapter 15. Peter's the one who announced the decision that salvation is by, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus alone, whether a person is a Jew or whether a person is a Gentile. And Peter's the one who said that the law is a yoke upon people's backs that even his ancestors and the Jewish people of other generations could not obey. So Peter being the one to announce that message in Jerusalem at the Jerusalem Council has now gone back on the message that he announced, on the truth that he announced at the gospel. I mean, the truth that he announced about the gospel in Jerusalem. And so... Paul writes about this to the Galatian people, and the reason he's writing about this to the Galatians is because he's ultimately going to get to Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. And he writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And he says that because he says, I know who bewitched Peter, and you're doing the same thing that Peter did. Peter was led astray by men sent from James. Now who's leading you away from grace and to the law? I know who, who led Peter away from grace back to the law. But who's leading you away from grace and back to the law? So that's, that's the context of this story. And it's the reason that Paul puts this piece of biblical history into Galatians because the Galatian people are doing exactly what Peter did. And that's why Paul puts this into Galatians. So let's take a look at Paul's confrontation of Peter when Peter went back to the law and he turned his back on the gospel of grace. He turned his back on the decision they had made in, in, in Jerusalem and in Acts chapter 15. Picking up with verse 11. But when Cephas or Peter, and I'm using the Berean study Bible, 
just uh, in case anybody wants to look with me in the Brian Study Bible, and I am on BibleHub.com using the Brian Study Bible. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I, Paul, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned, or he was in need of being corrected because the decision they had reached in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council, Peter had turned his back on that decision. And the law he, that he said was a yoke of bondage, a yoke of slavery, a heavy burden. He's now put that burden back on himself and he's put the burden on the Gentiles. The very weight of the law that he, he said that the Gentiles don't have to follow in Acts is now the law that he's putting on them that Paul's referring to. So this, this just in chronological time here, the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 took place around AD 49, AD 50. So the, the book of Galatians was written after Acts chapter 15. So at some point in time between Acts 15 and the writing of Galatians, Peter went back to the law. He abandoned grace and went back to the law, which is exactly what the Galatian people did. So picking up with verse 11, but when Peter came to Antioch, Cephas, Peter, I opposed him to his face because he needed to be corrected from because he had left grace and had gone back to the law for righteousness. Verse 12, for before certain men came from James, Peter had been eating with the Gentiles. But when they, these certain ones who came from James, but when they came, Peter was drawing back from the Gentiles. He was separating himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those of the circumcision group. So he would no longer eat with the Gentiles when those who came from James, from Jerusalem to Antioch, and when those who came from James from Jerusalem to Antioch began to influence Peter by telling Peter, you should not be eating with the Gentiles. By eating with the Gentiles, you're breaking the law of Moses. The reason that Peter abandoned grace and went back to the law was we see it right here in verse 12 is because he was afraid of those of the circumcision group. Now, the circumcision group were the Gentiles. I'm sorry, the circumcision group were the Jews. The uncircumcision group was the Gentiles. And so if you look back up here in verse 7, I believe, of chapter 2, it talks about, but on the contrary, having seen that I had been entrusted, that's Paul, I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter to the circumcised. So Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles, whereas Peter's ministry was to the Jews. All right, that's why you see First and Second Peter addressed to the Jewish people, because that was his specific area of ministry. So that was a big deal during this culture, circum, the, the circumcised. The Jews prided themselves that they were circumcised and they would harass the, Jew, the Gentiles or mock the Gentiles because they were uncircumcised. Remember when David faced Goliath, he called him the, the uncircumcised Philistine, the uncircumcised Gentile. All right, so that was, that was a big thing to them. They took a lot of pride in, in that, uh, for sure. Um, but when they, that's the ones sent from James, came to Antioch. Now, the Antioch here is the Antioch of Acts chapter 11. It's Syrian Antioch. Syrian Antioch, the church in Syrian Antioch was started after the, the exodus of people out of Jerusalem because of the uh, persecution that was going on, and Paul was leading much of that persecution. They, they were arresting people. Some people were dying, such as Stephen, for believing that Jesus was the Christ. A persecution started in Jerusalem. And there was a mass exodus out of Jerusalem escaping this persecution. Well, there were some, some men who were from this persecution, from this scattering, who went into Antioch. 
And they begin sharing to the Gentiles about Jesus being the Messiah, the Christ, about his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And many of the Gentiles begin turning to faith in Jesus. And you can read about this in Acts 11. And there were so many of them turning to faith in Jesus that the Jerusalem church sent Barnabas to Antioch. And again, this is Syrian Antioch, which is different than the Pisidian Antioch of Acts chapter 13. All right, two different Antiochs. <clears throat> so Barnabas goes to Syrian Antioch in Acts 11, and he sees how many Gentiles have come to faith in Jesus. But he knew that they needed to be educated more fully in the gospel. So we see that discipleship in Acts 11 has nothing to do with spiritual disciplines. Barnabas goes and gets Paul and brings him to Antioch to help teach these Gentiles in Antioch about the gospel, about grace. And that's what we find out in Acts 11. They, they educated them more fully in the truths about grace. So discipleship biblically is much different than what it is in our modern day Christianity. In modern day Christianity, discipleship is more about getting people to practice spiritual disciplines, getting people into small groups, getting people serving in a ministry. That's not biblical discipleship. Biblical discipleship is educating people about spiritual truth, not getting people to embrace spiritual disciplines. And so, Paul and Barnabas begin educating these believers, these new believers in Antioch, about the truths of the gospel of grace. And, and we can read about what Paul would have taught and what Barnabas would have taught by what Paul writes in Romans and what he writes in Ephesians and what he writes in Colossians and what he writes in Philippians and what he writes in Galatians. This is what Paul would have been teaching in Antioch. So. Barnabas goes and gets Paul. He brings Paul to Antioch. Okay, eventually, Judaizers or Pharisees come from Jerusalem to Antioch. That's in Galatia, uh, that's in Acts at the beginning of chapter 15. And they begin debating with Paul and Barnabas, saying that justification is not by faith alone and Jesus alone, but if you want to be right with God, if you want to be forgiven by God, if you want to be clean before God, if you want to be accepted by God, if you want to be innocent before God, if you want to be saved, then it's faith in Jesus plus obedience to the law of Moses. Well, that brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute with these Pharisees the believing Pharisees. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but they were also attaching the law to salvation. And so that's what prompted Paul and Barnabas and those who went with them to go to Jerusalem to discuss what is the gospel? Is it faith plus obedience to the law, or is it faith in Jesus plus nothing? Is it faith in Jesus plus Judaism, or is it faith in Jesus plus nothing? And they come to the conclusion in Acts 15, 11, it's faith in Jesus, it's grace minus the law is what brings a person into a justified standing or an innocent standing, a forgiven standing, a righteous standing, a saved standing before God. So that the reason they had that discussion or that meeting in Jerusalem was because of what was taking place in Antioch when the Pharisees, the believing Pharisees came to Antioch and they began to dispute what Paul was saying and Barnabas was saying about the gospel. All right. So after Acts 15, somewhere after that, Peter is now in Antioch. Peter and Barnabas is in Antioch, but Paul's not there. And so here comes these Pharisees again, these believing Pharisees again from Jerusalem, but these ones were specifically sent by James. That's what we find out in verse 12. For before certain ones or specific ones came from James, 
which seems to be here in the context, James handpicked who he wanted to go to Antioch to see if Peter was truly spending time and eating with the Gentiles. We've, we've got to go correct Peter. Peter's breaking the law because the decision that they made in Acts 15 was a decision that the Gentiles did not have to follow the law of Moses. They didn't make the decision that the Jews didn't have to follow the law of Moses. That was not a decision that was made. They all agreed that salvation was by faith in Jesus, but there was no agreement that the Jews don't have to keep following the law. We're just not going to make the Gentiles follow the law. So here's Peter eating with the Jews, I mean, eating with the Gentiles. We've got to correct that. That can't be. That seems to be the situation because for some reason, Paul wanted it to be very clear in this letter to the Galatians that certain men were sent from James. Now, a lot of Bible commentaries will try to defend James here, and they will say, well, James, James really didn't send, send them. They just say they were sent by James, but he really didn't send them, which would make Paul 100% wrong in verse 12, because Paul is saying that certain men came from James. He didn't say, well, they said certain men came from James, but James really didn't send them. That's not what Paul says. He just says before certain men came from James. That's a real direct statement that James sent men from Jerusalem to Antioch to correct Peter. Seems to be what's going on. Um, if anybody, if you're interested, I've written a little booklet called uh, Paul and James, where they're really in agreement, uh, looking at the theology of Paul and looking at the theology of James. Um, it's on Amazon. It's just a little, I think, 35-page booklet if anybody uh, wants it. Um, it's there. Okay, verse 12. For before certain ones came from James, Peter had been eating with the Gentiles. Now, why would have Peter been eating with the Gentiles? Because two reasons. He had an encounter in Acts chapter 10 where God gave him a vision. And in that vision, God was communicating to Peter that he did not have to follow the law of Moses anymore. He could eat the foods of the Gentiles. He could eat in the homes of the Gentiles. He didn't have to follow the divisions that were in the law of Moses between Jew and Gentile. He didn't have to follow the dietary laws that were in the law of Moses, that he could actually eat the foods and eat in the homes of the Gentiles. So he creates a scenario for him where Peter or uh, eventually is in um, the home of a Gentile, Cornelius, and he's eating the foods of the Gentiles, and he's eating in the home of a Gentile. And God arranged all that to help Peter understand that the law of Moses is over. The law has been abolished. That's what Peter, that's what Paul writes in Acts chapter 2. It was a really difficult message during these days because uh, it was a highly religious culture. The Jewish life re revolved around the law of Moses, and now they're being taught the law is over. The law is obsolete. The law is finished. There's a new group of people called the church that's made up of Jews and Gentiles where the law of Moses has no part of. It's all about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul makes that really clear in Galatians and very clear in Ephesians as well. So verse 12, for before certain men came from James, Peter had been eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, these men from James, Peter began to separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of the circumcision. He was afraid of the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem. He craved their acceptance. And one of something we can learn here is when we crave the acceptance of the spiritual leaders around us, of the church leaders, of the ministry leaders, when we crave the acceptance of the ministry leaders, the church leaders, the small group leader, the Sunday school leader, when we crave their acceptance, we will not communicate the gospel. When we fear their rejection, we won't communicate the gospel. Because this message of grace is as divisive 
now in the church as it was during the culture that it was first communicated in. It, it's going to cause problems simply because it's, it's breaking the traditions of ministries and denominations. It's, it's, it's breaking the whole method of discipleship that's so embedded in, in so many ministries and so many denominations and so many churches. So it is going to cause division, but we can't let fear keep us from communicating the message. We want to communicate it in love. We want to communicate it in kindness. We want to communicate it in grace, but we don't want to back away from communicating the message. That's what Peter did. That's why Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, that in verse 10, I don't seek the approval of men when I communicate the gospel of grace, because if I sought after the approval of men, then I wouldn't communicate the gospel of grace. I want God to approve of what I communicate, not men to approve of what I communicate. So by communicating the gospel of grace, it is going to put uh, people who communicate that message into some difficult situations. They could lose their jobs. They certainly will lose their reputation. They will lose respect. Uh, you will become the object of criticism, the object of slander. Uh, religious leaders will tell their people, you don't want to listen to him. You don't want to listen to her. They'll lead you astray. They'll lead you away. That's exactly what Paul went through in the book of Acts. You can read about that on his missionary journeys. Okay, <clears throat> so Peter began to separate himself from the Gentiles by not eating with them anymore, even though in Acts chapter 10, God said, hey, you can eat with them. You don't have to follow the divisions of the law nor the dietary laws of Moses. The law has been abolished. And then look what happened in verse 13. And also the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically with Peter so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was carried away. That's, that's fascinating to me because Barnabas is the one who went, who was originally sent from Jerusalem to Antioch to see that, to, to confirm the salvation of so many Gentiles. And then when Barnabas is in Antioch, Syrian Antioch, he sees how many Gentiles have come to faith. He knew they needed to be discipled or taught about the truths of the gospel of grace. And so he goes and gets Paul, and Paul comes back to Antioch. So Barnabas was, was one of the key leaders in this church in Antioch, sent from Jerusalem to Antioch. Now he goes and gets Paul. And, and now who, who are causing the problems in the church in Antioch? Leaders from Jerusalem who were sent by James, who are now leading Peter away from the truth of the gospel of grace, and Peter is now leading Barnabas away from the gospel of grace, back to the law. That, that's just fascinating church history here. So that the only one standing for the truth of the gospel of grace in Antioch is Paul. He's the only one. Now look what Paul says in verse 14. But when I saw that they are not walking in line with the truth of the gospel, what's he referring to there? He's referring to the decision that they made in Acts chapter 15, verse 11, where Peter says it's by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we're saved, not by the law. The Jews are saved by grace through faith. The Gentiles are saved by grace through faith. And the law plays no role in salvation. And we don't want to put this heavy burden of the law on the Gentiles. That was the the, the decision that was made, and that's what they were walking away from. They were walking away from the decision that was made in Acts chapter 15. But when I saw that they were not walking in line according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live like a Gentile, meaning you're Jewish, and at one time you followed the divisions of the law of Moses, you followed the dietary laws of the uh, law of Moses, you follow the days and the diets and the duties and the, the demands and the divisions. But there came a time in your life, Peter, which would have been Acts chapter 10 and, and following, where you stopped following the law and you started living in grace. 
And grace says you don't have to follow the dietary laws of Moses. The, the law of Moses, you're dead to the law. You're alive to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says here to Peter, Paul says, if you being a Jew live like a Gentile, can eat whatever you want, eat with whoever you want. You don't have to follow the Sabbaths. You don't have to follow the festivals. You don't have to follow the sacrifices of the law. You don't have to follow any of Leviticus, any of Exodus, any of Deuteronomy. Okay. If you being a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, and the Jews were following the law, Moses, uh, um, Peter no longer was following the law. Why do you compel the Gentiles to follow the law of Moses? So that's interesting. Now here's Peter, who was free from the law, who had, who had now gone back to the law because he was afraid of his religious leaders. And not only doing that, what's amazing is, is he's trying to get the Gentiles back under the law. The very law that he says was a heavy burden in Acts chapter 15, verse 10. And it all comes, the root of all of this in the heart of Peter is fear. He craved the acceptance of the leaders in Jerusalem. He craved their acceptance. And because he craved their acceptance, he changed his, the message. And when, when we crave the acceptance of religious leaders, church leaders, pastors, ministry leaders, when we crave their acceptance, we will change the message. And we will water down the message of grace by adding some type of works to it. Not necessarily for salvation, but just if you want to grow with God, if you want to get close to God, if you want to stay forgiven by God, we'll begin to water down that message in order to align our message with those whom we crave their acceptance of. So he's, he's trying to get the Gentiles back under the law. Now, verse 15, we Jews by birth, this is Peter, or this is Paul talking to Peter. We Jews by birth and not sinners of the Gentiles. Some Bible translations will put sinners in quotes. And the reason why is the Jews would call the Gentiles sinners. That's, that's what's going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The word sinners typically is most of the time in quotes referring to lawbreakers, basically. Those lawbreakers over there us religious leaders, we don't break the law. All right. But the majority of Jewish people would look down on the Gentiles and say, oh, those sinners, those sinning Gentiles. That's why Paul says in Romans 1 and 2 and 3, he's seeking to <clears throat> convince the reader that not only, <clears throat> not only are Gentiles sinners, but Jews are sinners as well. He he, he clearly communicates in Romans 1 that the Gentiles are sinners. Then in Romans 2, he seeks to communicate that the Jews are sinners as well. And then he moves into chapter 3 to say all are sinners. And that's when we get to Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all being all the Jews, all the Gentiles, everybody's alike under sin. We're all sinners, and we all need the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need his cross. We need his blood. We need his forgiveness. And Paul's trying to communicate this as well in Galatians. So verse 15, we Jews by birth and not sinners of the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of law, except through faith in Jesus Christ, through belief in Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So Paul is saying, Peter, you know, you know, Peter, that a person is not justified, made right before God, made righteous by God, declared to be in right standing with God, declared to be accepted by God, not guilty before God, as if they've never broken the law. Peter, you know that being justified by God has nothing to do with obedience to the law. That's the decision we made in Jerusalem. That's, that's where we came to in Jerusalem, that it's by faith, it's by trusting in Jesus and not by trying to obey the law, which is the entire problem in Galatia. 
they had, they had been convinced that righteousness was through trying to obey the law rather than trusting in Jesus when Paul had clearly communicated and established them in the truth that righteousness or justification is by trusting in Jesus and not trying to obey the law. It had been reversed now in Galatia. All right. So Paul's telling Peter, Peter, you know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but you're trying to get the Gentiles to go back to the law for justification when you clearly know that is incorrect. That's why he stood to be corrected. That's why he stood to be condemned. That's why he had to, this had to be pointed out in front of everybody because everybody had been led astray. So P Paul's having to correct Peter in front of everybody to get the gospel back into the church in Antioch because the gospel had disappeared. When Paul disappeared, the gospel disappeared, basically. When Paul left Antioch, here comes the religious leaders from Jerusalem. They're going to get people back under the law. And that happened everywhere Paul went. He'd, he'd teach about grace. He would leave. And here comes the Judaizers. Here comes the lawmen from Jerusalem. Uh, he writes about that in Acts chapter 19 and 20 when he knew he would never see the Ephesians again. And he warned the Ephesian elders who were the leaders of the church that as soon as he left, the attack on grace would begin by these wolves and these wolves being uh, these religious leaders. They would come in and they would attack the message of grace. They would attack the messenger of grace who was Paul. All right. So he's telling Peter, Peter, you know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. So why are you trying to get the Gentiles to go back to the law when you know very well that's not how a person is justified? It's by grace through faith in Jesus. We settled that matter in Jerusalem. And then verse 17. But if seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners, is Christ, then a minister of sin, is Jesus promoting sin? All right, what does that mean? <clears throat> the only reason a person would come to faith in Jesus is because they've realized they're a sinner. I mean, why did Jesus go to the cross? He went to the cross to die for our sins. All right, he went to the cross because we're sinners. And because the penalty of sin is death. And that the, the, in Romans, the, the wrath of God, um, when judgment will come upon the earth and only the righteous will, will survive and only the righteous will live on the new earth. To really understand righteousness, we've got to go back into the Jewish scriptures because when we read the book of Psalms, even into Proverbs on some verses, it's very clear that a judgment is coming upon the righteous and the unrighteous. Those who are righteous will be declared innocent by God and they will live forever, eternal life. Those who are judged as unrighteous will not have eternal life. They will perish in judgment. And that's what the book of Psalms tells us. We can find that as well in the book of Proverbs. Uh, and, and that was a very clear teaching in Judaism, in the Jewish scriptures. If you're righteous, you will live forever and have eternal life. If you're unrighteous, if you're ungodly, if you're evil, if you're wicked, then you will be cut off, you will perish, and you will not live forever. On, on the new earth, in the kingdom of God. So that's why this topic is so important that we understand. What's the big deal about righteousness? Because that's what the scriptures tell us. Those who are righteous will have eternal life. Those who are not righteous will be cut off. They will perish is what the Jewish scriptures tell us. And so the, the Jewish leaders, the people were trying to always justify themselves by obeying the law because the law is the, st is the standard of righteousness. Uh, Moses talks about that. It's the standard of righteousness. Psalm 119 talks about that the righteous laws. Okay, the, It's the standard of righteousness. So if God's going to declare me righteous, it's going to be on the basis 
of me working under the law, obeying the law of Moses, and then he will declare me righteous. That was the mindset of the Jewish culture, the leaders of the people. And the Pharisees were dedicated to obeying the law because they knew that to have eternal life, you've got to be righteous. The standard of righteousness is the law, which is the basis of God's judgment. Ultimately, the two great commandments are, are the ultimate basis of judgment. Love God, love people with all your heart, and love people as, your, uh, as yourself. And so that's, the, that's what's going on here. And so when Paul comes with this message straight from Jesus, that the, you cannot be righteous through the law. Actually, the law shows that you're a sinner. And by the law showing us that we're sinners, it points us to Jesus as our Savior. The law points us to grace. And once we're pointed to grace and we come, in faith, and we come to faith in Jesus, then you leave the law behind. The law is obsolete in the life of a believer. The Ten Commandments can still convict an unbeliever of sin, leading him to the Savior who is Jesus, and then the believer leaves that behind. All right. So in verse 17, but if seeking to be justified in Christ, if, if a person becomes aware that I'm a sinner, the law has done its work in their lives. It's, it's brought them to a point where they realize that they're sinners and, and Jesus went to the cross and he died on the cross for sins. And now it's through faith in Jesus that I'm declared to be innocent because at the cross, he took my guilt at the cross. He took my sinfulness and he's offering freely his righteousness so that I can have eternal life in his kingdom and in the, the new heaven and, and in the new earth, the home of righteousness as Peter talks about in 2 Peter 3. Does that mean, if, 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 if me becoming aware that I'm a sinner is what would lead me to faith in Jesus, well, does that mean that Jesus promotes sin? Because the only way I know that I need to come to faith in Jesus is to become aware that I'm a sinner, then, it, then is Jesus promoting sin so that I'll put my faith in him? And I think the reason Paul writes about that in verse 17 is that's what he was being accused of. That's what these religious leaders in Antioch were accusing Paul of. Well, you're just saying Jesus promotes sin, Paul. You're just saying, you know, on one hand, in, in Galatians, I mean, in Romans chapter 6, or in, really in Romans chapter 3, Paul was being accused of giving people a license to sin. And, and now these same religious leaders seem to be saying, well, Paul's just saying Jesus promotes sin because the only reason a person would need to put their faith in Jesus is if they realize they're sinners. Then Jesus is telling people, you can, yeah, hey, you need to sin, so you'll see that you need me. And Paul says, may it never be. That's just not a true statement. And what we'll discover as we begin communicating the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, is a lot of things will begin to be said about you that isn't true. Rumors will be spread about you that isn't true. Well, he's just saying people can sin all they want to. He's saying people can go murder people and commit adultery and, and it doesn't matter how you live. I mean, the attacks and the accusations about you and the criticism for teaching the gospel, they're not going to stop. But we can't stop sharing the gospel of grace. We've got to continue doing that no matter what is said about us. So verse 17, but if seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners. Meaning, if I discover that I'm a sinner through the law, and that's what Paul writes about in Romans chapter 3, 20, 19 and 20. He also writes about that in Romans 5, 20, that the law increases sin so that we will see that we need Jesus. Jesus is not the one increasing sin so that, we, so that we'll know we need Jesus. The law increases sin so that we know we need Jesus. Paul was being accused of saying, well, Jesus is increasing sin in the life of people so that they know they will need Jesus. 
Paul said, no, 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 no. That's so not true. It's the law that increases sin. And that's what Paul writes about in Romans 5.20, as well as in Romans 7, 7 through 25. But if seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners. Is Christ then a minister of sin? Never may it be. Don't think that way, Paul is saying. For if I build again the things that I had torn down, I prove that I myself am the sinner. So I think what Paul is saying here is the real sinner is the one who rebuilds the law. That's the real sinner. It's like he's telling Peter, hey, Peter, you're rebuilding the law. So the real sinner is the one who rebuilds the law. The one who is really sinning is not the one who isn't living under the law. The person who is really sinning is the person who is rebuilding the law, which is what Peter was doing in Antioch and trying to get people to obey the law. That's the real sin that's happening there. It's, it's the sin of Hebrews almost. It's it's close to the sin of unbelief, but it, it's not the sin of unbelief here because they believe in Jesus, but it's the sin of, of going back to the law for righteousness. It's the sin of going back to the works of the law for righteousness. That's the real transgressor here, All right? Because re remember, those Gentile sinners, those, those Gentile sinners, they don't have the law. Well, those who have the law are sinners as well because they they break the law, then to rebuild the very law that has been abolished is a sin. To put people under the law is a sin. Peter was sinning by putting the Gentiles back under the law. Peter was sinning by turning away from grace and going back to the law. Look what Paul says in, in 19 to put this in context. Remember, he's talking to Peter. Peter, for through the law, I died to the law. Peter, you're rebuilding the law, but I've died to the law. Peter, I've died to, whether, to not being able to eat with the Gentiles. I can eat with the Gentiles. I've died to the dietary laws. I've died to the divisions between Jew and Gentile in the law of Moses. I've died to the Sabbaths. I've died to the sacrifices. I've died to the ceremonial washings. I've died to the complete book of Leviticus. I've died to the book of Deuteronomy. I've died to the book of Exodus. I've died to the temple. I've died to everything that Judaism is because Judaism points to Jesus. Judaism is a shadow, which is what the book of Hebrews is about, that points to the person of Jesus. So I'm not going to relate to the shadow of the law. I'm going to re relate to the person of Jesus. So he tells Peter, I died to the law, Peter. But Peter, you've come back alive to the law. You've now died to grace, Peter, and you've gone back to the law. Peter, I've died to the law that I might live for God. Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. It's, it's I can't live I can't live in relationship with God while depending upon the law for righteousness because the entire reason Jesus died was because the law convinces everybody they're unrighteous. He takes our unrighteousness upon himself at the cross, and then by faith, he gives us his righteousness, or we receive his righteousness by faith. For through the law, Peter, I died to the law that I might live for God. Peter, you can't live in relationship with God and relationship with Moses. You can't live in relationship with God and the Ten Commandments and the diets and the duties and the demands because God's brought an end to all that. And then he goes into verse 20, and so many believers are very, very familiar with Galatians 220, but they don't they don't know anything about the context of Galatians 220. They don't know that Galatians 220 fits into a wider conversation between Paul and Peter, a confrontation of Peter, of Paul to Peter. And the question is, why don't most believers know the context of Galatians 220? Is because most pastors don't know the context of Galatians 220. If most pastors knew the context of Galatians 2.20, then most believers would understand it, but they'd never been taught it. 
they've been taught Galatians 2.20, but not 11 through 19 or verse 21. So understanding the context, now let's look at Galatians 2.20. So Paul's talking to Peter, and he says, Peter, I've been crucified with Christ. When Christ died on the cross, the law died on the cross. The law was nailed to the cross with Jesus, Ephesians 2, Colossians 2. So he's saying to Peter, Peter, you're wanting to be alive to a law that was nailed to the cross. And not only are you seeking to be alive to it and obey it, but you're leading the Gentiles to do that as well, which is the very thing in Jerusalem you said that they shouldn't do because it's a heavy weight. And now you're putting this heavy weight on the Gentiles because you're so afraid of these religious leaders sent from James from Jerusalem. So he says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So here's what Paul is saying. Peter, I don't live by focusing on the law. I live by focusing on the life of Christ, on the death of Christ, who I died with Christ. When he died, I died. He, he nailed my sins to the cross. So I, I died to the law, Peter. When Christ died, I died. When he was crucified, I crucified. The law, the law was nailed to the cross with Jesus. It's no longer in operation. So I don't want to resurrect the law, which is what Peter was doing. And if he resurrected the law, then he proves that he is he's sinning by resurrecting the law, which is the point Paul made in the earlier verses. So he says, I've been crucified with Christ, Peter. I no longer live. It's not about me living to try to obey the law to be righteous before God. It's not me. It's, I no longer live according to the law. I no longer live according to the disciplines in modern day Christianity. When somebody sees this truth, I no longer live according to me trying to be right with God, me trying to gain confidence with God, me trying to gain acceptance with God, me trying to gain approval with God by following a set of spiritual disciplines that the church, the church leaders have placed upon me, that if I'll do these things, I'll grow. If I'll do these things, I'll get closer to God. If I'll do these things, and when we begin living under these disciplines, then it becomes the basis of how we relate to God. And if I practice the disciplines, I'm confident in my relationship with God. If I don't practice the disciplines, I'm not confident in my relationship with God. If I practice them, I, I don't feel guilty. If I fail to practice them, I do feel guilty. So the spiritual disciplines in modern day Christianity have replaced the law of Moses in historical Christianity. Because nobody's really living under the law. Nobody's sacrificing animals. Most believers aren't following the Sabbath days and, <clears throat> and the festivals <clears throat> of Leviticus. <clears throat> but this religious mindset <clears throat> continues, this wanting to do something. I've got to do something. <clears throat> so the point Paul is making here, <clears throat> he says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I'm not trying to earn righteousness. I'm not trying to earn acceptance with God. I'm not trying to gain confidence with God <clears throat> anymore because I died to the law. But Christ lives in me. The resurrected Christ now indwells me. <clears throat> and you see that the message of Christianity is not to be a Christ follower. <clears throat> That's so much, that's the dominant message of Christianity today. It's in most membership classes, uh, in most churches who have membership classes. Th their dominant phrase is becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus. That's not the message of Christianity. That was the message of the early ministry of Jesus. When people, when, when people would follow him, they wanted to be his disciples. They wanted to learn from Jesus. They wanted to travel with Jesus during his earthly ministry. And he told them, here's what you're getting into. You got to be willing to take it. If you're going to follow me, if you truly want to be my disciple, you've got to take up your cross because you're going to die. Because I'm going I'm to die. And it wasn't a salvation issue. It was simply meaning John the Baptist has his, his disciples <clears throat> the Pharisees had their disciples. Jesus had his disciples. 
people wanted to be a disciple of Jesus. And he says, all right, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to follow me, here's what's going, here's what it's going to take. All right. That's not the message of, of the resurrected Jesus. That's not the message that the ascended Jesus gave Paul. It, it's, it's not the message of the cross. It was the message of the earthly Jesus to those who wanted to be his disciples and those he called to be his disciples. <clears throat> but it's certainly not the message of, of the cross. The message of the cross is the resurrection as well. <clears throat> and Christ coming to dwell in us. So most churches are communicating a message that just isn't biblical. Hey, becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus, good luck. I mean, when do, when do you ultimately become fully devoted? At what point can you say, I'm a, I'm a fully devoted follower of Jesus, because it's all about me. If that's the message, <clears throat> If that's the message, becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus, then where's the cross? Where's the cross? It's not about becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus. It's coming to understand fully what Christ has done for us. And that's what Paul writes about in Galatians 4. Until Christ be formed in you. Until you understand the fullness of what Christ has done for you. All right. So Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It's not about me trying to be right with God. It's not about me being a fully devoted follower. It's about me understanding that Christ now indwells me. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And this life that I now live in the body or in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, the one who loved me, and who gave himself for me. Notice the concentration or the focus of Paul in, in living post-law. Because Paul used to, I mean, the fact that Paul would say, I died to the law is a, is a miracle, because his whole life was determined by what the law said as a Pharisee. His dad was a Pharisee. He was raised as a Pharisee. He was in the university that taught Judaism. He was a rising star in Phariseeism. His whole life was dedicated to become a fully devoted follower and ad adhering to the law of Moses. And for him to say, I've died to the law, and now my focus is 100% on the love of Christ for me, not me living according to the law. The one who loved me, the one who gave himself for me because I can't do it. I can't obey the law and be righteous, but Jesus took my righteousness, my unrighteousness at the cross. And now by faith, I receive his righteousness. And, and he lives in me and he loves me and he's leading me. So the life of a believer is this. Jesus loved me because I can't obey the law. I, my disciplines can't do it. My morality can't do it. My adhering to any spiritual activities can't do it. Jesus went to the cross. He died for me. He died for my sins. He offers me his righteousness as a free gift that we receive by faith. So Paul says, this life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, the one who loves me and who gave himself for me at the cross. This is grace. Grace is what Jesus loved me and he died for me. That's grace. He died for all my sins. Then we come to verse 21, and again, most people know verse 20, but they don't know anything before it, nor do they know verse 21, and 21 pulls us all together. He says, Peter, I do not set aside the grace of God. That's what Peter had done. The very grace that he spoke about in Acts 15, 11 is the very grace he has now set aside. And the reason, Paul, the reason Peter set aside grace because, was because he craved the acceptance of, this, of the religious leaders that James sent. So James had sent leaders to Antioch, and, and now Peter, and persuaded Peter to, to set aside grace and to return to the law for righteousness, which is, again, a fascinating, fascinating event in church history, which is 
where Galatians 2.20 comes from. And most believers have no concept of what's going on historically to really appreciate Galatians 2.20. So he says, Peter, unlike you, I do not set aside the grace of God for righteousness. Because that's what he says next. For if righteousness is gained through the law, if I can become right with God by practicing the law of Moses, then Christ died for nothing. Now, to the modern day believer, it would be this. If I can be conf- if my confidence before God is directly related to my practicing the spiritual disciplines, then Jesus died for nothing. If my confidence before God is directly related to adhering to any church requirements, uh, church disciplines, Christian disciplines, activities, serving in a ministry, wherever we, whatever we would put there, it, for if righteousness is through the blank, for them it was the law of Moses, just draw a blank there. If righteousness or being right before God or being confident before God or being accepted by God or being innocent before God is gained through me practicing fill in the blank, then Christ died for nothing. The entire reason Jesus went to the cross is because there's absolutely nothing you and I can do to make ourselves righteous. He took our sinfulness at the cross, and now he offers us his righteousness as a free gift. And and when we add something to it, faith in Jesus plus the disciplines for acceptance with God or confidence with God, then we've watered down the blood of Christ. When we mix works with the blood of Christ, whatever the work is for confidence before God, righteousness before God, feeling right in my relationship with God, then what I'm saying is my relationship with God is dependent upon Jesus plus me. And what Paul is saying here in Galatians 2.20, it's Jesus minus me. It's Jesus that has nothing to do with me, but has everything to do with him. And faith receives what grace has achieved for us. And then we go into, and we'll wrap it up right here and pick up here in our next session. Is remember, the Bible is not broken up in chapters and verses. So there seems to be a break between Galatians 2.21 and Galatians 3.1 if we read it as chapters and verses, but remove the chapters and verses because Paul didn't use chapters and verses when he wrote this letter. So what he says here is he says, oh, foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? I know who bewitched Peter. I know who convinced Peter to to seek to gain righteousness through the law, to set aside grace. It was the men sent from James. The men sent from James persuaded Peter to abandon grace and return to the law. But I want to know something, Galatians. I know who I know who it was with Peter, but I don't know who it was with you. Who was the person who bewitched you? Because Jesus was publicly betrayed as crucified before your very eyes. So somebody did the same thing to you. Somebody convinced you that the, that the cross of Jesus was not enough to bring righteousness. Just like the men sent from James convinced Peter that the cross was not enough for righteousness. It was the cross plus the law. And now those who have come to Galatia are convincing you that the cross isn't enough. It's the cross plus the law. So who is it, Galatians? With Peter, it was men sent from James. I'm curious, who's the one who, who's the ones who bewitched you?